It's great hearing you guys worship this morning. Uh, when we come to worship, we're not just expressing our feelings towards God, but we're also reminding ourselves to gather the words of the gospel. So it's a privilege to be part of that with you this morning. It's a privilege to hear you guys sing. Uh, now we're going to hear from God's word. So our scripture reading this morning is going to be in 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. So 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 2. Uh, I'm going to read all of these verses for context, but we're really going to spend all of our time this morning just on verse 5 of chapter 1, uh, because as we uh, continue uh, periodically going through 1 John, we'll see that here in verse 5 of chapter 1, John uh, puts an idea out in his letter that is really important, really crucial for the next, especially the next two chapters. So we're going to spend today focusing in on verse 5 uh, to really get this idea down. And again, if uh, you have the app, the Parkside Church Lake County app, there's a place in there under the Sundays tab to follow along, to take notes. There's a fill-in-the-blank outline. There's also a place to tap in your own notes as well. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, if that's helpful, uh, be sure to make use of that. First John chapter 1, 5 through chapter 2, 2. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the, propiti the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, as we come before your word, help us to hear from you. Speak to us today, convict us of our sin, and show us our precious Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. So recently, uh, Laura and I went out to California, we went to the West Coast to visit my brother and sister-in-law. And while we were there one day, we decided to take the train, take BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit, I think that's a cool name, to take that into the city of San Francisco. And while we were on the journey, while we were going along, we discovered that at one point going into the city, the train actually goes underneath the bay. There's a tunnel and the train goes underneath the San Francisco Bay. So we're going along on the beautiful, sunny, bright California countryside, and then out of nowhere, just darkness, just pure black darkness. You look out the windows, and it's just, it's just black. It's nothing. And it was kind of disorienting a little bit. It was a little shocking to go from bright, beautiful sunlight to just darkness. The weight of the darkness was almost kind of palpable. It was kind of shocking. There was the, the light in the car was still on, so it wasn't like we were just in pitch darkness. Otherwise, I would have been you know, freaking out like a, like a child. <laughs> but <laughs> but just, e just the idea that we were surrounded in a tunnel underneath water, just surrounded by darkness, was kind of unsettling. Because light is really important. Kind of like the air we breathe, it's essential to life. But also like air, we don't, al we don't often notice light until it's gone until we have a day like today that's cloudy and rainy and snowy and we see the absence of light and things just feel gray and dark and gloomy. We don't notice it until it's gone, but every once in a while, every once in a while we come to a moment of appreciation. We see a beautiful sunrise that causes us to pause for a second. We come to that time of the day in the summer when the sun has just started to set and it fills the sky with warm oranges and yellows and reds, and it's beautiful. Or that moment on a cloudy day like today, a rainy day like today, when, when the light breaks through, when the sun breaks through the clouds, and we see a rainbow. Now scientists, they talk about light, and they say that light, it's a particle, or it's a wave, or it's something like that. But, but in those moments, when we see it, those moments of, of luminous awe, it seems like it's so much more than that. It seems like it's so hard to define. Because really, light defines us. It defines the world around us. Without light, it would be impossible to see anything. That's the lesson I learned on the train. 
It can turn a bleak and depressing landscape into an awesome scene of shapes and colors. It can turn a dark and foreboding house into a warm and welcoming home. Light is really important. It transforms our world. It gives definition to our world. It brings life into our world. It provides definition and understanding. It changes everything. So it's no wonder then that when John starts off his letter, 1 John, and he's talking about the nature of God, he describes God as light. He says God is light. And this is more than just a sentimental metaphor. It's not just a fluffy thing you'd see on a greeting card. It's actually a vital revelation about the nature of God. Because remember what he says at the beginning of the letter in verse 3, John says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you. See, John was a follower of Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest guys, so he was an eyewitness to Jesus. He saw everything Jesus did. He heard everything Jesus taught. And now he's writing this letter to share these things with the churches, to share the things he's learned from Jesus, the things that Jesus taught him. And in verse 5, we come to the explicit message that he heard from Christ. And this me- he says in verse 5 that this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So John is not just proclaiming some idea he came up with. He didn't just sit in a room and come up with this idea that God is light, and he's just telling people about it. This is something he heard from God. This is revelation from God. This is a direct message from Christ. So it's really important to look at this message, this message that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So we're going to look the rest of our time together today at this message. We're going to look under two headings. We're going to look at it under two headings. First, the illumination of God's light. The illumination of God's light. Second, the integrity of God's light. So the illumination and the integrity of God's light. So first, the illumination of God's light. Now, my sophomore year of college, I went on a trip with some friends for spring break to Florida, as college students do sometimes. And there was one day where a friend of mine and I, we decided to get up early which for a college student, that's really unusual, but whatever. We got up really early at like 6 in the morning, went down to the beach in the darkness of the early morning because we wanted to see the sunrise because we were coming from Ohio, and there's no point seeing the sunrise in Ohio because it's just you can't see it because of the clouds. So we decided we were in Florida, we're going to go to the beach, we're going to see the sunrise. So we make our way down from our hotel room in the dark. We can't see in front of us. We didn't bring a flashlight or anything because we're not very smart, and we're just walking down. We go down to the beach. We can't see our hand in front of our face, and we just stand there, and we just wait for the sun to rise. And at first, everything around us, it's dark, it's black, it's gloomy. But then slowly, we begin to see a little change. We begin to see the light that was, the, the sky that was black, it begins to be gray. And then all of a sudden, we start to see blue, and then we start to see some, some orange and some red and some yellow. And then slowly but surely, that, that bright orb starts to make its way up the horizon. And as it does so, it reveals things around, it revealed things ar- about our world. It transformed the world around us. The, the water of the beach that, that was once just dark and gloomy was now being filled up with brilliant blues and, and shining sparkles, and it was beautiful. And the sand that was gray and dull all of a sudden was filled with whites and oranges and browns and yellows. See, the light had taken this place that was dark and that was gloomy, and it filled it with life. It enlivened it with colors and with brightness and with beauty. It gave definition to where we were. We could see where we were. We could see our way back to the hotel because the sun had risen, because light had brought definition into our reality. And so this is, this is a picture of what God does for the world. This is a picture for what God does for his creation. He provides life. He provides light. He provides definition. And we see this picture all throughout the Bible. We see if we go back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God, he creates the heavens and the earth. He creates the earth, and it's, it's formless, and it's void, and it's covered in darkness. But into that, with a word, God ushers in light. He gives life to his creation. He gives definition to his creation. He gives light to, the re- to reveal the truth about the world and to reveal the truth about himself. And then John himself, he picks up on the same theme if we go back to his gospel in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, where he writes regarding Jesus. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not 
overcome it. And then if we go a little bit further in John, Jesus himself, he verifies to this truth in chapter 8, verse 12, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. See, to say that God is light is to say that God is in the business of illumination. God is in the business of illumination. It is his very nature to reveal himself to his creation. It is his joy and his glory to make known his character and his will and his love for his creation. He wants us to see that he is the source of our life, that he is the basis for everything that we have. And this illumination, this revelation, it reaches its brightest point in Christ. Christ is the light of the world, the Son of God. He reveals the clearest picture of God to us because Christ is God himself. He is God and man. So in his time on earth, in his time of teaching and of ministry and of, of walking with his disciples and of people, he, he revealed to us the character and the nature of God. He is the brightest form of illumination of the nature of God. And this revelation that we have in Christ, it shines the brightest at the darkest moment in human history. Because at the cross... At the cross of Christ, we see God's clearest self-illumination. See, at the cross here, he, God, he reveals the ultimate truth about himself, and he reveals the ultimate truth about us. In this moment, when Christ was on the cross, when the sun stopped shining, God's truth, it broke forth into our hearts. It breaks forth into our hearts with incandescent illumination. It's at this darkest moment that the truth is revealed. And what's revealed? There's two things that are revealed to us at the cross, two things that God provides definition for. The first is our sin. Because when we look at the cross, our sin is revealed because we see that we have a problem that is so serious that it costs the Son of God his life. That when we look to Jesus on the cross, we can't avoid the fact that we're the reason he's there. It leaves no doubt in our minds that we are sinful that we are sinners, that God is light, but we are darkness, that God brought life to the world, but we ushered in death. And so we have a problem. We have sin. We have darkness in our hearts. And just like night and day are separated in Genesis 1, the light of God and the darkness of sin are separated. They cannot be together. Light and darkness cannot occupy the same space. So we have a problem because our sin separates us from God. And this is the problem that Christ came to fix. And when we see the cross, we see that. We see the need we have. We see the problem we have. We see our sin. But the second thing that the cross reveals is that the cross reveals our Savior. Because the fact that Jesus died on the cross shows us that we have a problem so serious that it costs the Son of God his life. But the fact that Jesus died on a cross also shows us that we have a Savior who is so loving that he was willing to give up his life. See, at the cross, we see that Jesus, the God who is light, who is perfect, who has no darkness at all, loves us so much that he willingly came and took on our darkness and suffered for it and suffered the punishment for it, suffered the penalty for it, so that we could be brought back into life, into the light. He bore our darkness in, in his body so that we don't have to because he loves us. So God is light. He is always illuminating himself to us. He is revealing the truth about him and the truth about ourselves, that we are sinners, but that by his grace we have a great Savior. And he reveals us. To this, he reveals this to us in his word through Jesus. And as he does so, as we see our sin, as we see our Savior, as we see the truth about our world, the truth about God, the truth about ourselves, it transforms our reality. Where once there was darkness, where once there was, there was gray and murky waters, now all of a sudden there's, there's brilliant colors, there's warmth, there's light, there's life. We see the truth that God is the source of our life. That God is the source of our life spiritually and physically. And that changes how we see our world. That adds new definition to our world. It adds new understanding to our lives. As C.S. Lewis once wrote, he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. God is in the business of illumination. He's in the business of revealing to us our sin and our Savior. And I think... 
that as we focus on, as we continue to think about the illumination that comes from the light of God, it brings us into our next point, which is the integrity of God's light. Because as we think about what these words mean, light and darkness, there's an element to it that takes us even further into this idea of what Christ has done for us. And that's when we have to understand the integrity of God's light. So that's our second point, the integrity of God's light. And as I was studying this, I couldn't help but think about the comedian Brian Regan. Brian Regan, he's my wife's favorite comedian, and I've really listened to him before, but once we got married, I listened to him, and he's, he's really funny. And he has, a, and he has one, one line, one joke that he does in his stand-up routine that's pretty funny just because I'm a child at heart, and so just I relate to this. But he talks about when he was a kid and how him and his brothers were so crazy, his parents would just send them out into the backyard just all the time just to get them out of their hair. And he says what they used to do in the backyard to entertain themselves is they would have contests to see who could stare at the sun the longest, right? So they would see who could get five seconds, and the next guy would try and get six seconds. And I would show the clip, but that would just completely distract you, and then you wouldn't pay attention to anything else I would say today. So we're not going to do that. But it's, it, you should look it up later because it's really funny. And it's funny because it's so relatable. I mean, what child hasn't, in a moment of curiosity, looked up to the sky and thought, hey, what's that big bright thing? I'm just going to stare at it for a while. And then immediately you, you feel the effects, the blinding effects of direct contact with light. Because direct sunlight is so pure, it's so powerful, it's so intense, that we can't stare at it, we can't look up at it without harming ourselves, without hurting our eyes. Because it's so bright, it's so pure, it's so intense. And this is the kind of intensity, the kind of the picture that John is getting at here when he talks about that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. It's incandescent, it's luminous, it's bright. We can't look upon it, there's no shadows in it, it's perfect. See, the God who is light, he's in the business of illumination. And as he reveals himself to us, we see a God whose light is holy and pure and bright. We see that when God has revealed to us that his light has integrity, that it's so pure that human beings cannot bear to look upon it directly. And this is, this is made really clear for us back in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. So turn there if you can. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through four, because there was a prophet in Israel, and, and he writes in, in chapter six, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah, he comes to the throne room of God. He comes into the presence of God. And immediately he is in awe. Immediately he realizes how holy and how perfect God is, how bright his light is. And he also realizes how, how imperfect and unholy he is and how dark he is. When faced with the light of God's holiness, Isaiah is confronted with the reality of his own darkness, with the reality of his own sin. And so he's in, he fears for his life. Because he realizes, I am unclean, I am lost, and I'm looking upon the Lord of hosts, the God who is holy, the God who is perfect, the God who is light. And I know that his light cannot stand darkness. I know that his light cannot stand my sin. So I'm going to be destroyed. I'm going to be cast out. Isaiah realizes that because God is light and he is darkness, that he is doomed before the presence of God because he is so imperfect. And this is our problem as well, that God is light and we are darkness. We were made to find our life in God. He's the source of our very life. But because of our sin, because of our unholiness, we are separated from God. We are far from him, and we can't make our way back to him because he is so holy and we are so lost. And this idea is helpfully illustrated, kind of surprisingly, but also not surprisingly, by Bill Watterson in his comic strip, Calvin and Hobbes. So I have, I have an example for us. Cal, uh, comic, Calvin and Hobbes comic strip up here. It's not as blurry as I thought it would be, which is a good start. So, uh, so Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin and his tiger Hobbes, they're hanging out, they're sitting under a tree, and Calvin turns to Hobbes 
with the kind of philosophical question that a six-year-old could probably never really ask, but whatever. And he says, if heaven is good, and if I like to be bad, how am I supposed to be happy there? It's a good question. And then Hobbes asks another one, how will you get to heaven if you like to be bad? Let's say I didn't want to do what I wanted to do. Suppose I led a blameless life. Suppose I denied my true dark nature. And then Hobbes, with a punch to the gut, I'm not sure I have that much imagination. And then Calvin with the conclusion, maybe heaven is a place where you're allowed to be bad. So there you go. So you have the theology of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man in four panels. So that's it. There you go. See you all next week. I think that's all that needs to be said. <laughs> no, but seriously, well, Calvin has a problem, right? He has an issue. He wants to go to heaven, which he knows is a place of goodness because God is good. But he knows that he likes to do bad things. So if he likes to do bad things, how would he be happy in heaven? And if he likes to do bad things, then how would he even get to heaven? Maybe he could deny his true dark nature. Maybe he could try and deny all the things that he wants to do and try and live a blameless life. But his best friend Hobbes knows that's not going to work because even in his wildest imagination, Calvin can never do enough good things, can never get totally get rid of his true dark nature. He just can't do it. So the only conclusion that Calvin can come to is maybe maybe heaven is a place where we're allowed to do bad things. Maybe someday God will just, he'll just kind of ignore our sin. He'll just be like, ah, whatever, I love you, you can come here, do whatever. Maybe that, maybe that's the only hope in Calvin's mind. That's what he can think of. And we're all Calvin. We all struggle with this. Just like Calvin, a six-year-old in a comic strip, is struggling with this, we do too. Because we know that we want to go to heaven. We know that we want to be with God, the God who is good, the God who is the source of our life. But we know that we like to do bad things. We know that we're bad. So how will we get to heaven? What will we do? Can we get rid of our darkness? Can we do enough good things to, get, to wash it away? Can we deny our true dark nature? Can we live a blameless life? Well, we can try. But then when we stand before the throne of God and we compare ourselves to his holiness, we compare ourselves to his light, we'll see that even all of the good things we do still fall way short because even the good things we do are filthy rags. Even the good things we do are filled with selfishness and idolatry and sin. We can't just get rid of our darkness. We can't wash it away on our own. So maybe, maybe it's the other thing. Maybe it's God will just kind of let us in anyway. Maybe God will ignore our sin. Maybe God will ignore our darkness. But God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light, and he hates darkness. He can't be in the presence of sin. He is just, and he has to punish it. So our sin, it separates us from God. So even in our wildest imagina imaginations, we can't get rid of our sin, and God will never just ignore our sin. So what's the solution? And the solution is back in Isaiah in chapter 6, in the following verses, verses 6 through 7. It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Guilt, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So Isaiah, he knew that he was doomed in the presence of God because of his sin and God's perfection. But then the angel comes, takes a burning coal from the altar, touches it to Isaiah's lips, and says, Your guilt is taken away. You have been atoned for. Your sin has been atoned for. See, the solution to Isaiah's problem, the solution to our problem, the solution to Calvin's problem, it's not to, to try and clean ourselves up and think that we can make ourselves good. It's not to hope that God will just somehow ignore our sin, ignore our darkness. No, the answer, the solution, is atonement. The solution for our problem is atonement. Now, now what is atonement? What is it? That's a churchy word that we throw around a lot, but what does it mean? It's a really important word, and to, and to look at what it means, let's look at back at Isaiah. So notice how Isaiah says in verse 6, he says that the, the angel took the burning coal from the tong with tongs, he took it from the altar. He took it from the altar. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Jewish faith, the altar was the place in the temple where sacrifices were made. The altar was the place where people brought animals to come and be killed for their sin. Because the people knew that before a holy God, they were sinful. They couldn't stand, so they needed someone to make atonement for their sin. Now, the word atonement just means to, to make reparations, to pay the price for something. So if you have a criminal who gets arrested and gets sent to jail, he's going to jail to make atonement for his crimes. He's paying the price 
for his crimes. He's making the reparations to society for what he's done. And so these people, they would, they would recognize their sin before God, and they would take an animal to the altar, and they would slaughter it at the altar for their sin. The animal would be their substitute. It would take all of their darkness upon itself and then be killed. But the problem was is that the people would have to do this again and again and again. Every time they sinned, they would have to go make a sacrifice. Every year, the high priest would make a sacrifice for all the people over and over and over again because every time they made a sacrifice, the animals stayed dead. Every time they made a sacrifice, they sinned again, and the animal, they had to kill another one. There was no final sacrifice for this, and there was no perfect atonement. So they were in this system of temple, of the temple and of the altar where they again and again came back to make sacrifice, to make atonement for their sin. So that's what the altar is. And Isaiah, he's cleansed by a burning coal from the altar, from the altar of atonement. This means that Isaiah sinned before God. He didn't get rid of it. God didn't ignore it. But instead, the price for his sin was paid by another. Someone else made reparations for his sin before God. And when we think about this, we start to get a clear picture of how we can stand before a holy God in the presence of a God who is light when we are so filled with darkness. Because we can't get rid of our sin. God won't ignore our sin, so we need atonement. We need a substitute. We need somebody who is perfect, somebody who is innocent, who is willing to come in to take our place at the altar, to take our darkness upon themselves, and to die for it. We need a perfect sacrifice, a perfect substitute. But as we said, we're in darkness. All of us is lost in sin and darkness. None of us is perfect. So who can that substitute be? Who can that perfect, innocent sacrifice be? But only God alone, the God who is light. He's the only one who could do it. He's the only one who is perfect. And this is what Scripture gets us to. Turn over a few pages to Psalm 18, verse 2, and look at what the psalmist says. He says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Then you don't have to turn there, but Jesus, in, in Matthew 24 and 42, it says, Jesus said to them, have you, ever, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So the psalmist says, God is the rock of our salvation. Jesus says that he is the stone that the builders rejected that has become the cornerstone. See, Isaiah's sin was atoned for, by a burning coal from the altar that had been burned up and destroyed. And then how is our sin atoned for? By the rock of our salvation. By Jesus, who is the stone that the builders rejected, who has become the cornerstone. Jesus is the stone, the cornerstone that went to the altar of the cross and was destroyed for our sin. So just like the, the burning coal at the altar was burned up and destroyed, Jesus took the fire, he took the wrath, he took the intensity of God's punishment for sin, of God's justice for sin upon himself so that we can be atoned for, so that our guilt can be taken away, so that we can be cleansed by this rock of our salvation. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God who is light and whom there is no darkness at all, the God who is, who is holy, who lives in unapproachable light, he took on our darkness and died for it. The God who was perfect took on our imperfection and suffered for it. The only one who ever lived a truly blameless life before God took on our blame and he died for it. He makes atonement for us. He is the final perfect sacrifice because three days later, he rises again. Three days later, Jesus came back to life to show us that the price had been paid in full. That we wouldn't need to make any other sacrifices, that we wouldn't need to keep coming back to the altar again and again, because at the cross, the final altar, at the cross, the final sacrifice was made. It is finished. Jesus, the rock of our salvation, has cleansed us, has made atonement for us, has made us clean, so that we can stand before the throne of God with confidence, so that if you put your trust in him, if you put your faith in him, you can have a relationship with God again. You can be reunited to the God who is the source of our light. Jesus took on our darkness and died for it in order to bring us back into the light, in order to bring us into a place where we can stand before God without fear. We don't have to say, like Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, because Christ has made us clean. He's washed us clean by his blood. 
so we can walk in the light of God with joy. We can stand in the presence of God and worship with the angels and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. See, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And that created a problem for us because we are full of darkness. But as we'll see later in 1 John, in chapters 3 and 4, John says that God, he's not just light, he's also love. He is love, and because he loves us, he sent his son, his perfect son, to come and make atonement for us so that we could come back to him and walk with him in the light. This is our hope. This is our only hope. We can't ignore our sin. We can't fix our sin. God won't ignore our sin. We need a Savior, we need a substitute, and we have one in Jesus. This is what God's light reveals to us. This is what God's light makes us realize we're desperate for. Because without Christ, we have no hope. But in Christ, we have a greater hope than we could have ever asked for or imagined. As Isaiah writes elsewhere, he writes, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of uh, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. On them has light shone. This is our hope. Christ, the rock of our salvation. Christ, the light of the world. Now, at, at our wedding, at Laura and I at our wedding, we danced. We danced. We're kind of Disney nerds a little bit. But we danced to the song, At Last I See the Light, from the movie Tangled. So the movie Tangled. That movie came out right when we started dating. We saw it together. It was just kind of one of those you know, romantic couple things you do. So that was just, that just became our song. So we listened, we danced to that song at our wedding. And I think as we wrap up our time together this morning, it's, it seems fitting to end with the words from that song. It goes, and at last I see the light, and it's like the fog has lifted. And at last I see the light, and it's like the sky is new. And it's warm and real and bright, and the world has somehow shifted. All at once, Everything looks different now that I see you. So can you say those words? Has your life been transformed completely by the God who is light? Has the light of the gospel come into your dark reality and provided definition, provided illumination, provided transformation, provided light? Because through Christ, God is the source of our life spiritually and physically. In him, we have a hope that transforms how we see the entire world, how we see God, how we see ourselves. It redefines us. It transforms us. It changes everything. Do you have this hope? Have you put your trust in Jesus, the rock of your salvation, the rock of our salvation, who is our substitute, who makes atonement for us so that we can stand before God, so we can worship him, so we can live our lives in the light? Do you have that hope? Have you put your trust in him? Are you walking in his light? Can you say like, like in the song that everything is different now because you've seen him? Because God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, forgive us for all the ways that we've um, been shallow in our understanding of what we are doing for all the ways, all the times we come to worship you, we come to your word uh, as, a, as a mere ritual, as a mere um, thing we do either to earn something or just because others have brought us into it. Help us to remember that when we are here, we are in your presence. When we open your word, we are before your throne. When we worship you, we are in the presence of your light. Humble us, Lord. Fill us with awe of you. Reveal to us our sin in your light. Show us our Savior in the light of his cross. Transform and redefine us, we pray, because of your gospel. Help us to go from here rejoicing, because we can stand in your presence. We can find our lives in you, because Christ gave his life for us. In his name we pray. Amen.